everyone, it's David Bommel coming to you again from Oxford in the UK. Once again, talking with I- Ivan Pepmoljak. Ivan, you based in the in Switzerland, is that right? Well, the company is in Switzerland. I'm still in Slovenia. I'm sh- shuttling back and forth a few times a year. So I'm really glad to be speaking to you again. Um, this last time we spoke, and for everyone's benefit, I'll link that video below. Uh, we spoke about a lot of things, and there were a few topics that we never managed to get to. But before we jump into that, we were talking before this call about some of the new sort of webinars that you have. You, you run webinars on a, on a regular basis, is that right? Yeah, uh, it's becoming a full-time business now. So we are running like a webinar a week, more or less continuously. I was just writing a blog post about webinars in May. Yet again, four webinars in four weeks. So it's it, it, it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to ask you about that because um, you you do a lot of free content. So you have free webinars, is that right? And then you have paid webinars. Exactly. So there's a whole spectrum of content. There is the obviously free blog posts yeah. uh, where I try to focus on some small thingies. Then there is the free podcast, uh, which we publish once a month, uh, usually one hour long, typically a deep dive into something that no one wants to talk about because it's either too deep or uh, is not sexy enough or you can't sell it or anything like that. Uh, Then there are free webinars. I do those like maybe once or twice a quarter. And then uh, there are paid webinars. Uh, Most of the stuff we do these days is paid, but we still publish free webinars now now and then so that uh, people with free subscription can try it out and see how these things work. And finally, there are the online courses, which uh, have, you know, the self-paced content and live sessions and hands-on exercises, support for um, the whole thing you would expect from a real course. Yeah, I mean, you, you, one of your popular courses, I think, these days is the automation course. Is that right? Oh, yeah, that one is more or less always sold out. So we we'll just decided to schedule a new one in uh, autumn this year. We have already most of the speakers lined up, uh, so it will be another interesting set of speakers coming from, you know, companies that do real life automation. Yeah, I think that's what's really good about the stuff that you produce. It's um, you, you're not trying to sell someone something. You like talk about a product and, you know, I don't want to say nitpick, but you, 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 you make sure the vendors are honest. I think that's the best way to put it. Well, to be honest, I am trying to sell you something. I'm trying to sell you my webinars. But yeah, I am not sponsored by vendors. I don't get paid if I write good or bad about vendors. So uh, I try to be as, uh, you know, independent and uh, hopefully unbiased, which is impossible, but still. <laughs> and uh, just, you know, document my view on how things work and why they don't work as well as they could. Yeah, I think I think that's good. I mean, one of the ones that you mentioned, which is interesting, you said you've got this one called non-technical aspects of networking. So, you know, w- what's that about? Yeah, so we started doing a whole series of uh, not strictly technology focused webinars starting last year with math for networking engineers. Ooh. Uh, yeah, uh, we found a great mathematician, Rachel Trailer, and uh, she did a series of webinars starting with graph theory and spanning trees. Then she did another one on queuing theory, you know, the QoS stuff that yeah. we always try to guess but never get right. <laughs> exactly. And uh, This week, she'll do the second part of reliability. So in the first part, uh, she talked about the, I think it's called coherent system analysis. So how do you represent a system that has multiple independent components and how does the reliability of the whole system depend on reliability of individual components and how do you identify the weak spots in the system, things like that. And this week, she'll talk about probability and reliability. Now that you have this system, which could be your network, for example, and you know how reliable each box in the system is, what is the reliability of the whole system? And it's one of those crazy things, you know, where you end up with one minus probability that something will fail, uh, 
to the power of n where n is the number of boxes in this system and then one minus that and then you multiply that with another <laughs> you mean, thing a, like that i mean this it sounds like a like a you you could go down a rabbit hole with these kind of things is it important for network people um to know like the theory behind the algorithms like ospf and stuff like that it depends on what you want to be if you want to be network practitioner, if you want to be a CLI jockey, then no, you don't care. Uh, the moment you have to start troubleshooting stuff, you better understand what you're doing. And if you want to be rightfully called engineer, then, you know, according to certain Wikipedia definition, engineering is based on science. And science uh, is usually based on math. So if you don't understand how probabilities work, how do you understand whether you build a reliable network? How do you know how to enhance the reliability of the network if you don't know how putting things together, you know, enhances or reduces reliability? And because people don't care about that, we, what they do is they go and they copy vendor white papers. And you know why vendors write white papers, right? So well, they can sell more stuff. I was going to say, let the cynical answer is that they can flog you stuff. Yeah. I mean, yeah, take two of those. Of yeah. course. Yeah. No, no, you need four of those. Two per data center. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's um, it's interesting because last time we spoke, you spoke about, and I'm trying to remember the word now, you said there's like this, this split of, of, of skills. You're going to get like a, a very small, well, perhaps a smaller selection mm -hmm. of really high-skilled people. And yeah. then, you know, low-skilled people their jobs might go away. Is that sort of, is that, is that one of the reasons why you're teaching this stuff? Uh, well, uh, definitely. The other reason is also that I uh, see that people tend to forget why we do stuff the way we do stuff. Yeah. Which is another series of uh, live sessions I will start doing, hopefully this summer. This has been on the back burner for, I don't know, at least five years. So I finally got to a point where it might start making sense you know, in my head, putting all together. So, you know, the, the, the basic stuff like, uh, for example, uh, why do we do ARP? Yeah. And what is ARP and why the heck do we have MAC addresses and IP addresses? And how did, did these things happen? And uh, for example, why did they decide to use MAC addresses in the good old days? And why do, do they still make sense or not? Or how we could replace them? I mean, these are very simple things, but if you never spend time thinking about them and learning about them and figuring out why people did things the way they did, then you never get to the point where you would really understand them. Is this that How Networks Really Work series that you're talking about? Is that right? Exactly. So, you, so let me under, see if I understand, right? You're going to look at like, the basics of networking and try and explain to people why it was done in a certain way rather than just accepting that that's the way it is. Exactly. That's the idea. Yeah. I mean, when does that start, Ivan? Because now I'm going to hold you to that because I want to join that. Okay. Uh, I think I have the first session scheduled in June yep. and then I'll try to do one per month throughout autumn. I mean, I don't want to flog your stuff too much. It's just I, I, I've been a subscriber. I need to renew my subscription, actually, um, to, your, to your stuff. And it's really good because it's exactly, as I think, as you say, you do the stuff that other people shy away from, I would say. Yeah, because this, what, what, what I do doesn't sell. No. I mean, I'm, I'm doing okay. I can't complain about that. But, you know, uh, this is not certification training that you yeah. can sell in high volumes. This is not something that you could run a training company with uh, 300 talking heads uh, yeah. being employed 40 weeks um, a year or so. Yeah, I mean, it's it's more, what I like about it is it's real world and it's based on your, I know it's everyone's biased because we all have our perceptions, but I mean, it's based on your opinions, which I think is good because it brings, you bring your experience to the table and uh, you tell us what you think. Well, good or bad, depending on who you listen to. <laughs> I think the vendors sometimes the vendors wish you weren't you weren't in the room <laughs> when you when you uh, when you yeah. attend some of these sessions. <laughs> but let's, probably so, yeah. But let's talk I, about that. Okay, so one of one of the topics we never got to last time was, I think one of your favorite topics. Well, 
I say that in a, in jest. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put it to you this way: vendors try and sell stuff. So Ivan, what on earth is SDN? Oh, what is cloud? <laughs> yeah, good answer. Yeah. Now the problem with SDN, well, there are like three problems with SDN. The first problem is that the original definition was, uh, you know, totally missed the mark. They came with this idea of centralized control plane, which makes perfect sense if you're a programmer and you're sick and tired of being locked out of the shiny box because Cisco hates you yeah. or Juniper or whoever else. I mean, it's not that they hate you. Uh, they have to deal with support calls. And if they give you access to the box and you mess up the box that's forwarding a gazillion packets per second and they get a support call on that, and uh, they make the headlines because, you know, in the end, no one will say you broke it. Everyone will say Cisco box broke. Exactly. Then, of course, they have to be careful. So you're a software developer. You hate that. You want to do your own stuff because, you know, you know better than uh, hundreds of people who have been spending 20 years working on this. Of course. Of course you do. You know how to program in the newest language, so it must be better. Yeah. People who are not familiar with Dunning-Kruger should look at the graph you get when you search for Dunning-Kruger. Uh, it's like a U-shaped graph uh, yeah. explaining how the less you know, the more confident you are in what you do. That's very and good. The left very good peak, one, yeah. And the left peak is called Mount Stupid. <laughs> So just for people who don't know, could you like, in, I don't know if it's possible, like in a, in a minute yeah. or less, tell us, you know, what's this original SDN definition that you've, that you've okay. mentioned? So the original SDN definition is that this is a system where a centralized control plane is controlling multiple devices. So you have like a so, controller, yeah? Sorry, go on. Uh, well, yeah, it's, uh, it, that thing obviously is then called a controller because you have to name it anything, yeah. something. But, you know, in every networking device, a router, a wireless access point, not to a lesser extent, a switch, a Linux box, for example, you have the management plane where you configure stuff. You have the control plane that is the brains of the box. And then you have the data plane, which is simple packet forwarding. The brains of the box have to solve simple things like, oh, this is the IP address of my neighbor. What's the MAC address of my neighbor? So how do I do that? Hmm, it's not configured. How do I do that? Oh, I send ARP. This is the very basics of the control plane. Yeah. And then there are things like spanning tree. Oh, I have two links to you. How do I, how do I figure out which one to turn down? Or I have two links to you and we want to bond them. So we will run something called LACP. So who will run LACP? Will it be done in hardware? Uh, no, that would be too expensive to implement. So it, it, it will be done in software. Yep. Uh, where in software? Well, where it doesn't matter really where the software is running, but it is part of the control plane. And so the original idea was to centralize all that into a single controller that is detached from the actual devices. And there are immediately a number of problems with this. The first one is that there is additional latency. Yep. You know, controller is a little bit away from the devices. And uh, so how will you detect uh, fast link failures? Like with BFD, we can do this in one millisecond. How will you do that if the controller is like three milliseconds away? Yeah. Uh, a, a bit of a problem. Second thing, obviously, controller is becoming a single point of failure. So you need a cluster of controllers. Because, you know, after all, you want your ARP to work. If ARP doesn't work, <laughs> you have a bit of a problem. Just a small one. Yeah, a small one. Like IP stops working. Who yep. cares? Who, who <laughs> needs IP these days? <laughs> well, IPv6 will solve all our problems. Sorry. Oh, yeah, of I, course. I, I mean, just... It will replace ARP with neighbor discovery. But yeah, same thing. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Go on. Yeah. Uh, so, you see, there are all sorts of very critical and very time sensitive things and uh, then you get the nature of the network which is a distributed system yep. and in a distributed system it's hard to do stuff even if the components are loosely coupled yeah 
So if you have independent nodes and they run routing protocols and we are happy with eventual consistency, which means that, oh, something bad happened and we will have loops for 10 milliseconds, but eventually we will recover and we are good. Yeah. Oh, we lost a few packets every now and then, who cares? That's manageable. Now imagine that you tightly couple these components uh, so that everything is dependent from the, on, on the single box in the middle. Yeah. Now the first question is, how can you make reliable connectivity from that box to everyone else? Because you know, if you lose connectivity to that box, you're brain dead. There's nothing you can do. Yeah. So, oh yeah, we need an out-of-band management network. So how will you build an out-of-band net management network? Will it be a classical network or will it be an SDN network? Oh, maybe it can be an SDN network and then we need an out-of-band management network for the out-of-band management network. <laughs> and, and, and then you get into turtles all the way down situation. That thing was, you know, patently wrong, but of course they didn't want to admit that. Uh, and it was really fun because they asked me to do a technical part of an SDN symposium. That was like half a year after this thingy was launched. And I prepared two slides and there were like five or six bullets on every slide saying, hey guys, I think this might be a problem. And we had two hours or so and we never got past the first slide. That's funny. Yeah. Because, you know, they all knew that these were problems. And uh, I think recording is somewhere online, so you can even go and watch it. But at one point in time, one of the panelists were, was turning to the other one saying, I told you this is a problem. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I mean, th this is the one that was based on OpenFlow. Is that right? The original way yes. to do it? Yes, yeah. So the idea was that, you know, you still need to program the hardware in the individual switches, line cards, if you wish. And yeah, OpenFlow will be that magic thingy that would program the line card. And of course, uh, the moment the whole thing escaped out of the academia, uh, they figured out that there is a gazillion things missing. So, you know, as, as long as you are forwarding on MAC addresses, everything is fine. When you want to add routing and access control lists on input and output, and then you figure out that these four things are independent. And imagine you have one forwarding entry and you want to do four independent things with the forwarding entry. So you have to program every possible combination of four different things, right? Yeah, I, I remember teaching OpenFlow courses because it was, it was so, I mean, you've done some OpenFlow courses. I, I, I looked at some of your stuff and I did some OpenFlow stuff and it, it sounded- I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, don't remind me of the, I'm reminding us both of the bad past. But I mean, it, it, it was this thing that it sounded very interesting on, on you know, in theory. Oh, yeah, theory was great. But in practical, it was like, it was a nightmare. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And so, of course, vendors jumped onto this and they quickly figured out that, you know, effectively, all the networking vendors are in the business of selling software. I think we went through this the last time. Uh, they, they, they claim they are selling boxes, but effectively they're selling software. So providing this low level agent uh, that would interact with their hardware, and in most cases they're buying hardware from Broadcom anyway, so where's the added value? Yeah. Uh, so providing the box and the ASIC and the agent on top of the ASIC and then someone else running the software, that didn't sit well with them. Yeah, I mean, so, it kind of, it, so today, I mean, I'm trying to, I mean, I can't remember, you'll have to tell us, when did you do that uh, presentation? And I mean, looking at where we are Probably today. Probably 2011. Yeah, so well, it's at the moment, about eight years ago. So at the yeah. moment, it looks like, I mean, OpenFlow went through this huge hype cycle, and but now it's kind of died a death, and very few, yeah. if any, people well, are practically you know, using you know, it. You, you know the Gartner hype cycle, yeah. right? Yeah. There's the throw of uh, disillusionment. For OpenFlow, I think it's the ditch of the disillusionment and it was flushed. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, does anyone still use it? I know there was some vendors, I'm trying to think of all the names now, that did have some implementations, but it-, it Oh yeah, uh, of, I would say still... that a lot of vendors still have implementations. Uh, were they ever used? I don't know. Well, there's at least one commercial implementation with the big switch networks. Yeah, I was thinking of Big Switch. I was I thought yeah. Big Switch had moved on from OpenFlow. I didn't know if they were still using it. 
Well, I think they are still using OpenFlow as the forwarding table programming mechanisms, but yeah, they heavily extended it to make it usable. Yeah. And then there is this interesting controller developed in New Zealand, it looks like, Fawcett. Oh, yes. And uh, we just I just published a podcast with Nick Buralio, who was using that, and he's using it to run his campus network. And he's extremely happy with how well it works. It's just that when you look at the forwarding pipeline that Fawcett is using, it has like 10 stages. Okay. And there are only a few switches on the market that expose 10 stages of the forwarding pipeline through OpenFlow. Yeah. So you are quite limited in what you can do with uh, that controller. So what switches you can use to you know make the network work but apart from that uh, nick is very happy with that and he says that for you know reasonably small networks that you want to manage as a single box which does mean you have to keep that in mind that it's a single failure domain yeah they have distributed controllers so they they did once I have to really study how they solve that problem because they claim they share zero state between controllers, which means that you just push the configuration down to the controllers and they all do the same thing because they have the same configuration and they're totally independent, yeah, which means that in theory, it could scale indefinitely. In practice, you would hit limitations, but in theory, you know, it sounds like a great architecture and Nick claims that it works, which is, you know, nice to hear yeah i mean it's it's it seems like it's these uh, open flow is a rage and then it became like very bespoke so like as you said like point solutions like specific solutions but it, it wasn't widely adopted exactly and of course because of this hype all the other vendor all the vendors uh, tried to you know get something out of this sdm brouhaha yeah so they started sdn washing their products yeah everything's sdn I have, yeah. a, I have an SDN shirt. That's it. Software defined shirt. <laughs> it's SDS, by the way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's SDE something. So, I mean, tell us about some of the other solutions because I know VMware came out with stuff. Cisco have come out with well, stuff. Uh, Everyone has. Many cases, what they call SDN is really just a well executed orchestration system. Yeah. So, if you take Cisco ACI, which for me is like one of the best designed uh, SDN solutions. Effectively, the APIC controller is just the orchestration system and it pushes down the policies and configurations and everything to the devices and devices run, you know, standard distributed control plane routing protocols, something like ISIS, something like BGP, a few other protocols to distribute policy and probably DHCP to bring everything up and so on. They turned SDN into an orchestration system problem, in which case, you know, it works perfectly because networks have been working in a distributed fashion for ages. And there's this thing called internet that is supposedly works pretty nice. I mean, after all, we are talking to each other. Exactly. And that's a and traditional distributed system. Yeah. And uh, then you just add an abstraction layer on top of that so that, you know, People who don't want to learn what BGP is don't have to deal with BGP. Yeah. They deal with thing is that uh, someone like Cisco in this case, things that are relevant to them, like the forwarding domains and the endpoint groups and the contracts between the endpoint groups and stuff, stuff like that. So can you give us like for people who don't know ACI and like Cisco have a, a, a few SD product, SD access, SD WAN, whatever can you i mean it's i'm putting you in the spot here ivan but you know to cut through all the hype and all the sales nonsense can you kind of like just talk you know what is aci like for people who you know should they go and study this stuff you know where's it positioned kind of what's your opinion about some of these things and then i want to talk about nsx as well okay so aci is really a data center fabric yeah. leaf and spine fabric uh, with an orchestration management and provisioning system, which is called controller because marketing. And through that controller, you can manage the physical fabric, you can manage the health of the physical fabric, and you can provision connectivity. 
you can provision. I mean, worst case, you can use it as a pretty expensive VLAN manager. <laughs> you can provision VLANs, you can provision VRFs, you can provision virtual routers, you can provision interfaces to the outside world, you can provision port channels. Okay. So, you know, network management system. Uh, you can go further and uh, you can start defining endpoint groups, which is where things become interesting because uh, then they stop working on the VLAN paradigm, the VLAN tag equals uh, virtual network equals subnet equals whatever, but uh, they start grouping things together into IP sets, if you wish. Yeah. And then they isolate the IP sets with uh, what they call contracts, which is really a combination of access control lists and PBR. Okay. Because contract can be, I can talk to you, or a contract can be, I can talk to you, but it has to go through a firewall. Okay. Which is really PBR. Yeah. So, you know, a traditional leaf and spine fabric with uh, ACLs and PBR on top of that, but present it in a way where you don't have to think about VLANs and VRFs and ACLs and PBR. And PBR, just for people who are not sure that policy-based routing, yeah? Exactly. Sorry yeah. about that. Yeah, no worries. Cisco being Cisco, you know, this thing preferably runs on the shiny boxes. Yeah. The new so shiny the, boxes. The, yeah. Of course, the new shiny boxes. <laughs> uh, and they have two problems with this. The first problem is that they can't do stateful firewalls because new shiny boxes can't install a new entry for every TCP session if the new shiny boxes want to forward a gazillion packets per second. Yeah. I mean, at terabit rates, it's really hard to keep track of every session. And the second problem is that uh, TCAM on uh, any hardware box, regardless of how shiny it is, is limited, yeah. which means that the moment you get into too many contracts, too many endpoint groups, too many thing is in the endpoint group, you start running out of TCAM. They're doing some crazily intelligent stuff to minimize the amount of TCAM they have to use, but you know, you're still limited by a fixed size table, which is not the problem if you're running in software because you know, yeah. a gigabyte of uh, packet filters, why not? So that's ACIs for the data center, Cisco solution. Yes, um, yes. I know you've, you've done a lot of stuff on data center and a lot of your training is data center. So I know, so VMware also brought out their own solution, is that right? Yes, uh, VMware uh, launched NSX a little bit before Cisco launched ACI. Yeah. And there's this story that Cisco actually wanted to buy NICERA and then uh, VMware snatched them and uh, you know, the former best friends turned into frenemies, and, you know. <laughs> That's exactly right, yeah. Yeah, soap opera. Uh, anyway, there are two approaches of uh, solving anything in the network. Either you solve it in the network or you solve it outside of the network. And if you remember how we solved voice calls in the good old days, we, we started with the ladies that were patching cables yeah. between holes in a patch panel. Yeah. And then we replaced ladies with the relays. And then we replaced relays with transistors. And then we replaced transistors with integrated circuits and so on. But throughout those 150 or whatever years, the network was always the smart component. Yeah. The switches always took care of every single phone call. So there was a phone call going from here to UK or to US and every switch on the way had to be aware of that phone call. Yeah. You know how bloody expensive that is. Yeah, that's why it used to cost a fortune to make phone calls. Yes. And uh, what we have today is we're running Skype over stupid infrastructure. I mean, it's not that stupid, but, you know, compared to uh, what the phone switches had to do, it's way simpler. Yeah. So we, what we did was we took all the intelligence and we put it on the edge and we call it Skype because intelligence at low speed is cheaper than intelligence at high speed. Low speed, you can do things with 
low cost, low speed CPUs. Well, they're neither low cost nor uh, low speed, but let's forget that. They're still uh, cheaper than doing the same thing at high speed where you can't rely on the CPU, but have to do it in ASIC, yeah. which means that you have to design it right. And you know, you're a programmer, right? Yep, I understand what you're talking about, yep. Yeah, uh, so if you d you make a bug in your code, uh, how quickly can you fix that bug? Yeah, well, not not at line rate, that's for sure. No, but you can make it. You can fix it in a few minutes, right? Yeah. If they uh, have a bug in ASIC, how long do you think it takes before they get the new version of the ASIC out? Uh, that's you know that's a total different story, isn't it? Because it's hardware. Yeah, it's uh, six months to a year. Yeah, hardware. Yeah, no, it's a good. Yeah, point. so. Uh, you better not have too much intelligence in the hardware because you know yeah. bugs are bugs. You will never get rid of bugs. Yeah. And anyway, so we always tried to do stuff faster and cheaper by pushing the intelligence out of the high-speed core yeah. and offloading it to where we have too many CPU cycles because you know yeah. you can't make a phone call and play Angry Birds at the same time. Well, some people can, but let's 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 keep that. Uh, that's why they buy a newer iPhone. That's right. Yeah. So in other uh, words, you're saying the CPUs on like the PCs and the phones yeah. are very underutilized. So you put the processing exactly. at, the, at the edge. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we did that for everything. We did that for voice. We did that for video. Yeah. We did that for storage. And now, well, now, an, a few years ago. Uh, people started saying, why don't we do that for virtual networks? Yeah. So why would we use VLANs? Why would we implement VLANs on the top of rack switches? Why don't we implement everything at the edge yeah. where the CPU cycles are cheap in the hypervisor? Yeah. And that's what NSX is all about. So they use this term of overlays, don't they? Yes. Effectively, use the physical network as an IP fabric yeah. and then run the virtual networks and routers and firewalls and load balancers and all that crazy stuff, which is crazily complex, in software on the hypervisors because CPU cycles are relatively cheap compared to ASICs. Yeah. Well, not if you have to pay VMware tax, yada, 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 but let's not go there. <laughs> the vendors have to make money. Oh yeah, of course. And you see, that's, a, that, that, that's the real cause for the big hate between Cisco and VMware. Because Cisco wants to make money by selling intelligent switches. Yeah. And VMware wants to make money by selling intelligent hypervisors and telling everyone, oh, by the way, the switches can be anything. You can buy the cheapest switch you can get on the market as long as it can route IP you can pay my expensive licenses to run NSX. It's a, I mean, I can understand the hate. I mean, it's like, so this is the question, you know, in the in the past we had like, even here in the UK, British Telecom, all these big telecoms companies making mm -hmm. fortunes because they were charging crazy prices for for telephone calls. Skype came on the, on the, on the market, um, WhatsApp, these kind of applications. And, you know, com companies now like Nortel don't exist because they, they can't make the money they used to. So do you see that kind of trend? Um, I suppose that's what Cisco and other company, networking companies were scared about. It, you know, VMware are, are kind of like trying to say, you don't need these expensive switches, just use, um, you know, cheap switches. Do you think that's that's happening or will happen? Or where do you see? Well, I mean, we've got all these competing SDN solutions. Where do, where do, what do you think? Well, uh, it is happening. Yeah. Because, you know, if, uh, if you just think about data centers, uh, for a lot of enterprises, it would be best if they would just shut down their own data centers and move to the cloud. Yeah. It would actually improve their security as well. Yeah, it's a good point because Amazon has implemented at least, uh, I think you've said it in one of your videos or something, a basic level of security, whereas a lot of companies yeah. don't. Yeah. If nothing else, they figured out physical security and redundant power supplies and all that stuff yeah. and got certification around all that. I mean, how many enterprises went through the same pains? Because, you know, trust me, I've been there. Those certifications are a royal pain. Yeah. So uh, for most enterprises, it would be, you know, technologically 
and commercially best if they would move to the cloud. But they won't for a number of reasons. And by the way, shameless plug, I did explain exactly this in one of the non-technical webinars that we talked about before. Okay. Yeah, that's End good. No, that, you, 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 <laughs> you're more than welcome to plug your stuff. I mean, it's if you can give us sort of the quick overview here, because now you've said, you know, and that was another question I had is like, you know, we, we had the old days of, you know, box by box programming. Then we had this whole SDN hype thing. Now we've got different vendors pushing different solutions. And a lot of people like you are saying, okay, we should maybe just go to the cloud. So from a networking, you know, new person's point of view, guys who are starting out, it's like really confusing, you know. So so what, what do you think? Like, should I as a new guy study more Cisco stuff or should I just go and study AWS? You know, what would you do if you were in your you know, early career? On one hand, as we, as we agreed, it makes sense to move into the cloud. Yeah. On the other hand, uh, not everyone will. Yeah. But by the way, uh, moving to the cloud does scare the networking vendors because uh, they can't sell their expensive stuff to Amazons of the world. Yeah. Amazon has their own control plane, their own software running on the switches, and they buy the switches from cheapest uh, East Asian manufacturer they can get. Yeah, we need to talk about white box switching because that's also on the list. I was going to ask you because you mentioned last okay. time cumulus and yeah. stuff, but let, let's. I, I don't want to ask you too many no. questions, so let's start with like. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll get. We'll there. We'll get there. Yeah. So, uh, eventually, data centers might disappear. Okay. But still, uh, networking is networking. Uh, we haven't changed Ethernet in forty years. We haven't changed TCP/IP in forty years. So why do people expect that you will be able to build good networks with no knowledge? Yeah, as in like, I've just put it in the cloud and this fluffy thing will just make it happen for me. Is that is that Oh, yeah. yeah. And then we get like 12,000 or whatever it was, uh, memcache demons running in AWS with UDP open to the outside world. <laughs> this is a story uh, for the people who don't know. I'm assuming this is a story of something that went horribly wrong. Is that right? Yes. So uh, one of the greatest ways of doing a DDoS attack is if you can find someone who will amplify your attack. Yeah. Then you find a target. Yeah. And what you do is you send IP packets with source address of the target to people who will do amplification for you. It has to be UDP based because with TCP, you would have to establish the session first. For UDP, you just send one packet and you get a reply back. Yeah. So the bigger the amplification factor is, the better for you as the attacker, because you know you might have a 100 meg connection with uh, uh, 1000 times amplification factor, you get 100 gig of traffic. Yeah. How cool is that? Yeah. A, a long time ago, they figured out how to do this with DNS. If you send the right DNS query to the right, uh, DNS servers, uh, then they will reply and uh, swamp the target. Yeah. You have to find something that uh, triggers, I don't know, a number of responses to a single query. And uh, that's why people stopped uh, having, uh, you know, anonymous or open uh, recursive DNS resolvers because anytime you are willing to respond to any DNS query about any domain, I can use you for the amplification attack. And then someone found out that there is this debugging or something protocol in memcache daemon. Memcache daemon is a simple thing, you know, it's an in-memory uh, key value store. So you put stuff in, you can read the stuff out. And with this one packet, you could dump the whole stuff or something along those lines. So you send one packet, you get the whole dump of the whole memory structure back. Yeah, and uh, you know, the amplification factor is, I don't know, in thousand. So, so in other words, if you put if companies are putting stuff in the cloud, or perhaps um, not locking their systems down, and, and uh, hackers were using their systems to do denial of service attacks, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, someone figured out that I send you hundred byte UDP packet, you send me back a <laughs> megabyte of traffic. How cool is that? Yeah. And then they just use my. So, if you wanted to attack me, you would send the, the packet as if you me, and then I would get that coming to me as a yeah. denial of service. Just exactly. Scale. Yeah. You just need to find, you know, enough stupid people who have uh, memcached these servers running on UDP, which is the first problem. Yep. 
uh, open to the internet, which is a second problem, and allowing UDP on memcached port arriving from the internet, which is the third problem, and responding to the internet queries, which is the fourth problem. So are you saying this is one of the, uh, is an example of why you'd want to put stuff in the cloud because Amazon would have taken care of this for you? No. Or are you saying this is one of the problems when people put stuff in the cloud that they don't well, fix Well, the problem things? is that uh, Amazon takes care of the baseline security. Yeah. So they guarantee that no one can walk into their data yeah. center and steal your UDP packets off the wire. <laughs> yeah. However, they can't prevent your stupidity. So if you create a new VM on Amazon, it is by definition protected with a security group that says, okay, nothing can get in, but the VM can go out, yeah. which is cool. Uh, if you want to have any incoming traffic to the VMs running in Amazon, you have to adjust the security group. Yeah. So smart people would go like, okay, I need access on port 80. I need access on port 443. And I will allow access on port 22, but only from my IP addresses. Yeah. Uh, obviously, if you don't know what you're doing and you're in hurry to get your, your great new idea out, uh, you struggle with that for 20 milliseconds and then you go to Google and you type the query, how do I allow all traffic into Amazon? And someone obligingly gives you a recipe how can you how you can add permit IP any any to the security group. Congratulations. You've got it working. Yeah. <laughs> sort of. Yeah. So I mean this this is the point that I think you if I understand you correctly, is that just because it's moved to the cloud doesn't mean that you don't need networking people and people who understand exactly. what they're actually doing. Yeah. And uh, it's even worse than that because uh, things in the cloud are uh, really simple as long as you have one VM running in one subnet in one region. Yeah. The moment you need the uh, zones, security zones, the moment you need to segregate routing domains like the web VMs should talk to the outside world, but the app VMs should talk to my data center. Yeah. And then you have VPN or direct connectivity back to the data center. It all turns back into traditional networking. Yeah. Packet filters, routing protocols, uh, VRFs, subnets, uh, load balancers. You go and take a look at how any cloud vendor is telling you how to build highly available applications. Oh, deploy different VMs in different regions and deploy load balancer in every region and deploy DNS-based load balancer on top of that for inter-region load balancing. And oh, by the way, you can do any cost toward the internet. And oh, you want to connect this to your data center? Yes, it will be IPsec and BGP. Thank you. Yes, very quickly it becomes, like you said, a networking issue. Exactly. I'm glad you said uh, or, that. Or, I'm glad you said or that. Or like VMware NSX. You know how you configure VMware NSX? First, you create a logical switch, which is a VLAN. Yeah. Then you create a distributed logical router, yeah. which is a VRF. <laughs> then you create the edge services gateway, which is really a Linux VM running uh, Quagga yeah. for routing protocols. And uh, I think it's Nginx or Varnish as a proxy and probably IP tables for the firewall stuff. It's all traditional networking. NSX is interestingly more traditional networking than Cisco ACI. That's interesting. So, I mean, I think the good news that you, that from what you, if I understand you right, from what you're saying is networking people don't need to worry, like their jobs are just gonna disappear. They, 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 their roles may, may change and the way they implement things may change, but all that knowledge of traditional networking is still relevant. Is that right? Absolutely. That's good. Uh, it, it, it's just the question, you know, of how many people and at what level we will need. Yeah, so so the lower end jobs might disappear because they're automated and stuff well, like that, yeah? Uh, instead of jobs being like in this shape, they will be in like this shape. Yeah. So you will have a lot of really low end jobs 
because someone will always have to, you know, wire the campus network. Yeah. Plug the cables in, that kind of thing, yeah. Plug the cables in, uh, configure VLANs on the campus switches, or at least plug in the controller that will do zero-touch provisioning of the campus switches. Yeah. The so-called uh, networking engineers, which uh, who are in many cases people who do nothing else but configure VLANs and ECHLs and VRFs and so on, those jobs will probably disappear. And the high-end jobs, I don't think, will disappear because in the end, someone has to know how things really work if you want to troubleshoot it. Yeah. So uh, you, you can't just throw a network away like you can throw an Android or an iPhone away and buy a new one. What a pity. Yeah, you, you can't rent a new network if your old one breaks down and you bring it to a mechanic. So, you know. So the advice would be, uh, you know, whenever I talk to you, I, the, the, the impression I get, the, the advice is make sure that you part of that group that knows what's going on. Make sure that you study um, different technologies. Don't just, you know, learn CCNA. In increase your knowledge. Is, is, is that kind of what you're saying? Uh, I, I think I'll have to quote John Chambers or someone. Uh, I, I don't know who it was, uh, or maybe he was copying someone else, you know. Uh, the things are moving so fast today that if you run full speed, you're barely keeping up with everyone else. Yeah, yeah. So it really doesn't matter, in my opinion, whether you think that networking is the thing to do or whether you want to go and study application architectures or whether you want to become a cloud expert or whether you want to figure out how DNS works, what is really important is that you keep moving. Like learning the new stuff, is that what you mean? Yes. Yeah. So always learn something new. Yeah. Always uh, try to figure out how stuff adjacent to your stuff works. Yeah. Always try to figure out how to do your stuff better. Because, you know, the moment you settle down and you go like, oh, I'm done for this life. It's only 15 years till retirement. <laughs> that's bad news. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think I, I saw this. I mean, when I, I started teaching call manager when it was 3.0, when, you know, Cisco just got into the VoIP world. And I saw how those guys who, the PBX guys who got, who were comfortable, let's put it that way, got obliterated, or whether their jobs did. And I mean, I think the concern for a lot of people this, with this, all this SDN hype, because it was hype for a while, is that network jobs will disappear. Well, certain types of network jobs will disappear. Yeah. So, you know, uh, whatever can be automated will be automated. No question about that. But now let's ask ourselves what can be automated. You can only automate stuff that you can describe. Yeah. So you can't automate trouble. Well, you can automate troubleshooting to a certain extent, but there will always be, you know, automating troubleshooting, for example, which is like the most complex activity. It's just walking down the decision tree. Yeah. But you can't program all the weird stuff into the decision tree at least not until you've first seen it. And uh, so there will always be need for people doing troubleshooting. Likewise, there will always be need for people doing new stuff. But Ivan, will I, AI not take all of this away? Come on. <sighs> <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot now. <laughs> uh, okay. AI is 90% uh, just applied statistics today, right? Yeah, it's machine learning. It's not really AI, is it? Uh, well, uh, it's, it depends on how you define our intelligence, yeah. okay? Yeah, good point. But uh, honestly, uh, I don't think that we've seen a system that would be able to come up with creative solutions apart from uh, exploring the whole solution space and learning from it in limited domains like Go or chess. Yeah, it's very limited. I mean, networking is a, is a complex thing. The problem is the unknown unknowns. Yeah, yeah. Because in Go and chess, the problem space is humongous, but it's well-defined. Yeah. You know the rules, you know what can happen. So yeah, you can take two machine learning systems and send them to fight each other and they will learn on the way and discover all the tricks that no one ever discovered because we don't have the CPU power to do that. 
But if you can't even define what the problem space is, like trying to drive around on a windy road in the middle of the night with 15 centimeters of snow on the ground in, ground in a snowstorm, yeah. good luck. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I, I, so coming back to, I, I'm just poking you obviously to, to try and make it interesting, but network, engin, network engineers have the advantage that we're humans and that we can learn this new stuff. And it sounds to me like you were, you were saying that, you know, we need to learn more and more if we want to have the good jobs, let's say. Um, and troubleshooting is obviously one of those skills that, that every person needs to, to work on having because that's not easy to automate. But basic VLAN provisioning exactly. can, you know, yeah. VLAN basics can be automated. Yeah, well, I mean, as I said, whatever you can eventually put into a flowchart yeah. can be automated. So let me go back to my question. AWS or, you know, CCIE? And I'm just poking you here, but like, what, what's your Both. opinion? Sorry, go on. Both? <laughs> Both, I like that. Honestly, if you focus just on AWS networking, it is a weird planet. It is like Alice in Wonderland because routing works a little bit differently and load balancing, not that much. Firewalling maybe works a little bit differently. But, uh, you know, once you get beyond that 10% difference, it's networking as usual. So if you have good foundation of how networking world, uh, works, so if you understand how routing and bridging and firewalling and load balancing really work, not how they're configured, not what command, commands you have to type in, but what, how they really work, you, lo you look at the AWS documentation and you go like, yeah, I got it. You just have to, you know, figure out the differences. So yeah, it took me, I don't know, maybe a week to go through the AWS stuff and figure out uh, how that works. Would I be able to pass the exam? Probably not because they would test me on, you know, the trivia, like what does this exactly exact command do and are these parameters right? Yeah. I have, that's why you have Google. I have no interest in that. Yeah, exactly. That's why you have Google. But then I was asked to do a presentation on Google uh, Cloud Platform. Yeah or compute, plan, GCP, whatever that means. And uh, I was done in a day because it's so similar to AWS. There are differences like, okay, subnets are not tied to availability zones. They're tied to regions or whatever it is. And there's a little bit difference here and there and there and there and there and there. But documentation is great both ways. So I was just able to go through that documentation. I think it was even on the flight to the customer. And uh, no, I, I, I told them that I don't have anything prepared, that it will be, you know, just whiteboarding. But it's so similar that, you know, there was not much to do. I think this is, I mean, I agree with you. This is what I found when I did my CCIE. I learned a lot about um, networking protocols and all the rest of it. And when I started learning like mm -hmm. Cumulus Linux or like other vendor stuff, it was easy because I understood the protocols rather than just the commands. Yes. So let's talk about yeah, let's talk about Cumulus. Sorry, go on. Yeah, sure. So you said that Amazon. So explain that for people who don't know. Amazon, Facebook, all these big, you know, providers. They don't necessarily use Cisco gear. What do they use, and why do they do it? And you know, why is it important for me as like a network person? Well, uh, a uh, we don't know what they're using. <laughs> Stuff from Mars. Uh, yeah. B. I'm told that all of them use everything and that they just try to minimize the amount of stuff they have to deal with, but uh, not always successfully. When Edge, for example, does it make sense to reinvent the wheel? If you have 100 data centers and you need uh, 10 When Edge routers per data center, I'm making this up. Sure. Does it make sense to build your own stuff for a thousand devices? Yeah, no, it doesn't. Because, you know, people who can program this stuff are bloody expensive. Yeah. So maybe this is not the best use of your resources because these same people could save you a ton of money if you put them to work at some other problem. Yeah. 
So they're usually focused on uh, optimizing the stuff that really matters. And for them, the stuff that really matters is compute and intra data center fabric. So all of them are uh, trying to get rid of the traditional vendor gear, like uh, data center switches, and replace that with hardware on which they would run their own software. Now, obviously that's hard, you know, we agreed that there are like a few people worldwide who understand how to do that stuff right. Uh, the other problem with uh, people like Amazon and Facebook, well, primarily Amazon, Google to a lesser extent, and Facebook is a little bit more open because they're not really focused on networking, they're focused on likes. Uh, these people don't, can't talk to anyone else. So it's hard, you know, to do stuff in isolation. Yeah. You can do it for a while, and if you're big enough, if you're like half the planet, then yeah, sure, who cares about the other half? But I don't think that anyone is at that scale. So they are diverging in different ways and doing their own stuff. And who knows whether they are doing the best possible stuff. You can't know because you don't know what they're doing. You know, I mean, Facebook have released their open, well, I can't remember the names now. They, they've got Facebook switches. They've got a Facebook operating system, stuff like that. So... Uh, I mean, okay, so let's let's put that in perspective. <laughs> yeah, I was okay? going to ask you. So, for like a traditional network person, because let's be honest, most people, you know, don't work for Facebook, or and, if, and not everyone works for a huge company. You know, is it is it important for like like an average network person to learn like this stuff, or should we just like concentrate on Cisco because it's the biggest market kind of thing? What, so, can you like talk around that? Yeah. So, uh, okay. So before we go there, and we will get there, I promise. <laughs> You, uh, you have to ask yourself, why is Facebook giving all this away? So why are they giving blueprints for switches away? Because they want to have multiple suppliers so yeah. they can play them against each other and get the lowest cost. Yeah. Why are they giving away the operating system? Well, because they want other people to find bugs in the operating system and improve it. I like that. Yep. Yeah, that's how open source works. Yep. I mean, there is this uh, great article from Simon Wardley, I think. Uh, I think the title is Beware of Geeks Bearing Gifts. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. And he explains how, you know, companies are using open source to play against other companies like uh, IBM investing heavily in Linux so that people would buy more IBM hardware and not uh, invest money into Windows licenses and stuff like that. Yeah. People don't do this so, for the love. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. For karma points. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's the reason they are uh, pushing this stuff out because the more people work on this stuff, the more bugs they will find, the more robust it will become. Yeah. Uh, do I care as a typical networking engineer? I think we should care. Because in the end, uh, if you bite into this unknown apple, you might get interesting results. I know uh, regional banks who went with Cumulus and are perfectly happy with that. Obviously, you won't save that much money if uh, you won't buy switches by containers shipped directly, you know, with a freight ship from Taiwan. Yeah. So the moment you start buying uh, 10 white box switches, you might be better off buying from Dell because at least the logistics are okay. You don't have to deal with a supplier in Taiwan. You deal with a supplier that's just next door. But then... Imagine the flexibility you get when you can put any software you wish on that hardware. Because, you know, today you have 10 switches, you want to buy a switch extra so that you have a spare part. So you don't uh, have to pay the two hour time to replace uh, maintenance service you are okay with next business day yeah. time to replace service. Guess what? You have to buy software for that box. You can't buy a box without a license. 
Yeah, and it has to be the expensive license like all the other boxes in your data center. But that box is just a pile of hardware sitting in your warehouse. It's not running. There's no value in that box. Yeah. Just imagine being able to buy software and hardware separately. Yeah, I wanted to ask you because, I, I, sorry, I keep interrupting you, Ivan, but just for, for the people who don't know, we're talking about white box switching here. Is that right? And can you tell me what that actually is? And, you know, uh, like, well, sort of like, uh, you know, I, I prefer disaggregation. Yeah. So can you explain that? Well, you know, what, what are we talking about? So disaggregation is the basic idea that we would start buying uh, networking stuff like we are buying all the other hardware and software today. Yeah. When you buy a laptop, uh, yes, you might have Windows pre-installed and it might be cheaper if you buy Windows with the laptop than if you buy laptop separately and then a copy of Windows. Or, oh, it's 2019, so you can just download a copy of Windows and it runs on your laptop. Yeah. Or you can download a copy of Linux and it runs on your laptop. Or you can download a copy of, I don't know what, some weird operating system and it runs on your laptop. Uh, modular drivers, but no, let's not go there. So you have the flexibility of buying the best hardware you want and the best software you want. And as long as the drivers match, you have a solution that fits your needs. Whereas, you know, with the networking, it's like, oh, no, no, you can buy this shiny box. Oh, it's full of software, but don't worry about it. the ASICs are really important. Oh, and you should you should buy the shiny box from us, even though the competitor also has ASICs in their box. And oh, by the way, we don't want to tell you, but these are the same ASICs because our box can do so much more. So on one hand, you know, the vendors are telling the customers that the boxes matter. And then they start discussing features, which are really software features of the stuff that's running on the box. Yeah. Anyway. Wouldn't it be great if you would be able to buy boxes from whoever handles the logistics well, like Dell, for example, yeah. and uh, buy software from whoever can develop software well? I mean, I would love to be able to buy certain operating sy uh, systems from Cisco and put them on third-party hardware. Yeah. Or I would love to run Junos on Cisco's ASICs won't ever happen, but you know. Yeah, but that's the dream, isn't it? Yeah. Well, one can dream, yeah, right? Yeah. 30 years ago, it was not in the interest of HP that HP Unix would run on IBM hardware, and it was not in interest of IBM that AX would run on Sun's hardware, and it was not in interest of Sun that Solaris would run on HP's hardware. And we had these closed ecosystems and it all burst apart when x86 came on the scene and uh, we got Windows and Linux, which run on any x86 platform. Yeah. 20 years from now, we might have this in networking. Yeah. Well, you can already have it today if you wish. So this is the disaggregation part. Yeah. And then the next uh, question is, where do you buy the hardware to run the software on? And you can buy the hardware at the cheapest possible Taiwanese or whatever supplier, yeah. in which case the hardware would not be in teal or gray. It would be in some random color, usually white or beige. And it wouldn't have a nice bridge in front. It would have whatever label, if any label at all. And that's why we call it white box hardware, because it doesn't come in teal. It comes in white. Yeah. Uh, I am told that in small quantities, white box hardware might even be more expensive than hardware from established vendors. Makes sense. Because uh, economies of scale just don't work if you don't have scale. So if you're buying five switches from someone in Taiwan, you know, it might be expensive. And when the power supply breaks, you have to ship it back to Taiwan, which might be expensive. So there are vendors who saw the niche. I mean, it can be a huge niche. Just imagine the niche called laptops today, yeah. where they would handle the logistics of the whole thing. So instead of buying from someone in Taiwan, uh, you can buy the switches from me and they would have the Dell label on it and they would be in the familiar Dell color and they would be slightly more expensive maybe than the switches you buy per container. But 
you can buy them locally, you can replace them locally, you can get a service contract, and you have a support center you can call in whatever language you prefer. And this is so-called bright box switching because it's not white box, it's branded. Yeah. Effectively, most hardware is made in East Asia anyway. So even the branded hardware with a label and everything is made in the same factory, probably, as the hardware that is in the white box. It's just that the color is different and the contractual relationships are different. Yeah. But in both cases, you have to put some software on the hardware. Which brings us to the next question, where do you get the software? If you are Microsoft, Google, uh, Amazon, or Facebook, you have your own software, you put your software on the box and you're in business. If you are anyone, almost anyone else, then you have this interesting problem. You can't work directly with hardware because the ASIC manufacturers, Broadcom in particular, don't want to tell you how the hardware works. You have to sign an NDA and they will only sign an NDA with you if you buy like uh, 10,000 ASICs. 10,000 ASICs is 10,000 switches, which is uh, what? 400,000 ports. Yeah. A bit too much for me, thank you. Yeah, exactly, for most people. So, yeah, so I have to buy software from someone who has NDA with Broadcom so that he can get the magic sauce that programs the ASIC and does everything around that. And that could be either Cumulus Linux or it can be IP Infusion or it can be two or three other companies that do this. So all those people have, you know, on one hand, a relationship with the ASIC manufacturers, on the other hand, relationship with the box vendors, because you know what's the biggest problem to put a box on hardware compatibility list? Stupid stuff like fans and power supplies and LEDs. Yeah. Because ASIC is the same in all boxes. Yeah. But the temperature sensor is a different IO addresses. It's mad. I think, Ivan, this is the, I, I, I always feel I could talk to you for hours and hours and we're running out of time. So let's, let me ask you this then. Okay, so we've we started with like open flow. That doesn't seem to be relevant to most people who will be watching this. Um, if you've got VMware, it sounds like NSX may be a good solution. If you've got Cisco, you would have ACI perhaps. White box switching, you know, if you've got scale. It, it, I think the, the, the well, question of- not so, really. Sorry, <clears throat> uh, you see, white box switching, but not in the build your own stuff. The Cumulus Linux thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Cumulus Linux or one of the alternatives. I love Cumulus Linux because it's Linux based. So the beauty of that approach is uh, that you run the same operating system on your servers and on your switches, yeah. which means that you only need one team to manage them all. Yeah. Obviously, you need a networking expert in the team, you need a Linux expert in the team, you need some other expert in the team, but you are dealing with one platform. Obviously, every monoculture has the problem of a bug <laughs> across the whole monoculture. <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> so there's this nice kernel zero-day exploit that your impacts your switches and your firewalls and your servers. Cool. <laughs> anyway, ignoring that. Uh, I know people who would do this for, I don't know, maybe even 10 switches. Oh, wow. Yeah, because uh, the beauty is that all of a sudden you use Linux everywhere, so you don't need two different teams. Yeah. You don't need two different knowledge sets. It's easy to automate. You can put any software you wish on these boxes. Oh, you want to you, you, you want to turn your switch into a DNS server? Just put ISC bind on it. You want to turn your box into a DHCP server? No need to ask the vendor. You just put uh, ISC DHCP server on it. Oh, I need static DHCP ranges. No need to wait for Cisco for three years. I just put another uh, DHCP server on the box and bam, I have all the features I need. <laughs> I mean, I like Cumulus, um, same as you. Yeah. It's Linux. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I've got a few questions because I want to pull it back to the people who, you know, not sure what to study. So, w firstly, would mm -hmm. you recommend Linux as something that network engineers need to learn? Absolutely. Yeah. 
I mean, uh, if nothing else, uh, eventually you will get to a point where you want to automate stuff. Yeah. And if you want to automate stuff, most of the automation tools, libraries, whatever, run on Linux. Ansible is on Linux, Puppet is on Linux, Chef is on Linux, uh, Salt is on Linux, Nornir is on Linux, Napalm is on Linux. Yeah, it seems to me like Linux is a core skill. It's like learning OSPF. You have to learn it. Well, it's like learning Word. Yeah, well, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, even even lower than that. Yeah. Yeah. So Linux is important. Now, I think years ago... Git. Sorry, go on. Git. Git's important. Learn Git. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, let, let, let me ask you this this way. We've got all these different SDN sort of solutions. It's confusing. So again, I can ask you the que- the typical question, putting you on the spot. What should I learn? You've said Linux. You've said Git. What else would you recommend I learn if I'm sort of starting out in networking? I mean, I'm getting my CCNA. What other things would I would you would you recommend? Well, uh, as as we said, Linux, Git, some Python. Yeah. It never hurts if you are able to automate some crazy stuff. Uh, Some other maybe higher level automation tool. Um, I I don't care if it's Bash or Make or Ansible. Just something that, you know, allows you to work at a slightly higher level so you don't have to program everything in Python. Yeah. Yeah, I can program everything in Perl. I don't ever need to learn Bash because I can do everything in Perl. But it gets boring after a while. Showing your age. Yeah, exactly. I didn't say Visual Basic. <laughs> well, same as me. That's where I started. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, won't, we won't go there. L- networking on Linux. Yep. Because if you master networking on Linux, then you can work with data center switches. You can, if you need, build your own router. After all, you can install OpenWRT on your access point and uh, configure that. You can turn your Raspberry Pi into whatever. So I would say that's another core skill. Uh, what else? Uh, something cloudy. Doesn't matter whether it's AWS or Azure. Both of them have free accounts. Both of them have great uh, learning tools. So learn to deploy something in the cloud. Yeah. Learn some application architecture. Uh, can, you, can you explain that? What do you mean by that? Uh, well, see, uh, figure out how you would build a good application architecture. How would you handle high availability? How would you handle, uh, I don't know, load balancing? Figure out why we need session stickiness. Do you have, do you have resources on IP space about that? Or is there something that you can recommend? Uh, I did do a course at your local university and the slide deck is still online and I think it's available with free subscription so people can just download it. A long while ago, the guy running the uh, high scalability or something like that blog, I'll send you the link and you put it yeah, into the great comments. Uh, he was publishing application architectures from various people that were presenting those architectures at uh, whatever conferences. So it was like, this is how Craigslist does it. This is how these people do it. This is how those people do it. Uh, you have to figure out, you know, how things are done correctly. Yeah. So that uh, when someone comes along saying, I need this long distance V motion between, you know, <laughs> London and Tokyo, you go like, uh, no, you don't. But you're not going to bridge from here to Tokyo? Come on. Of course. What could possibly go wrong, right? <laughs> just for everyone watching, that's sarcasm. So if it doesn't come across, we're just joking. Oh, no, we aren't. <laughs> okay, so anything else? Ivan, I, I'll keep you here for another hour, but I know our time's almost up. So any other core skills that you would recommend people look at? Uh, soft skills. Okay, so like people skills, that kind of thing, yeah? Yeah, uh, talking with people, uh, listening to people, yeah. trying to understand what they're telling you, uh, mentoring. So when you talk about mentoring, like finding a mentor? Well, both. Uh, you see, well, obviously, if you're brand new, you can't, uh, it's hard to become someone's mentor. Yeah. But uh, if you have like five to 10 years experience, it's great if uh, you have time to be someone's mentor because, you know, 
the best way to learn is to explain something to someone exactly. else. Yeah. Which also means, by the way, go to conferences, present, go over stage fright, uh, go to whatever local meetup or user group or whatever, stand in front of 10 people, tell them what you did, whatever. Yeah. Because when you have to prepare for the presentation, it's amazing how much you figure out, how much you don't know, and uh, how much you learn because you don't want to be the idiot who can't answer the question. Exactly. Which, by the way, brings me to another point. Uh, admit when you don't know. Yeah, don't, don't fake it. Yeah, don't fake it and don't be ashamed that you don't know because it's impossible to know everything. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, so just for everyone who's watching, I mean, you've been doing this for how long? Uh, since 19... 80s a long time and Ivan a long time let me ask you do you know everything about networking <laughs> oh no so for the rest of us definitely not for the rest of us we don't have to pretend we know everything no well, I mean you are hurting yourself if you pretend that you know everything yeah. because a you won't learn and b people will uh, you know stop respecting you because they will always ex expect that you're bluffing yeah that's a good point and i mean things change so quickly so i mean this is how i feel just once i feel like i got a good understanding of a technology mm -hmm. then the goalposts move well i wouldn't say that technology moves so fast but yeah products yeah yeah so ospf hasn't changed in how many years that's a very good point yeah so i mean other i, yeah. I suppose that's the Saving grace, for lack of a better word. I mean, I've still got my old BGP books here and my old OSPF books. It's still relevant. Well, uh, it's relevant, but uh, although the core principles never changed, they did heap a lot of features on top of BGP in particular. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. It's becoming the kitchen sink of networking. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to make coffee one of these days. Yeah, of course. So, uh, Ivan... Ivan, I want to thank you so much for sharing, you know, all this knowledge and wisdom with all of us. Um, unfortunately, I see we are out of time. So I just want to say thanks so much. Oh, thanks for inviting me and thanks for poking me with pointed questions. Oh, I love it. It's so, it's so cool. So everyone, if you've enjoyed this, please like this video. You know, please subscribe to the YouTube channel, you know, all the rest of that normal stuff. But more importantly, put questions below this video. If there are things that you want me, to, want me to ask Ivan. Ivan, hopefully I'm going to be able to twist your arm again and get you, you know, to share some more stuff with us. Oh, we'll definitely do that. If you like this stuff, obviously go to my website as well and start exploring. Yeah, I mean, that said, I mean, I, I, please go and have a look at um, Ivan's website. You know, send him some love because, you know, he's doing this, I would say, as a mentorship and giving back. So appreciate it, Ivan.